Welcome in for day 12, and you're speaking with the Meeples champion. So we've been going over the last week and a half, a lot of different games, and I was trying my best to make sure not to do a repeat, not to do multiple games that were very much alike or from the same manufacturer that was clearly just uh, a next level game up. However, it is time on day 12 to jump into one that is from a big group of games that I've already discussed. We went over Raiders of the North Sea, and I think it's time to start talking about the other trilogy and one of the best games there, which would be Architects of the Western Kingdom. Now, Architects of the Western Kingdom is the game that introduced me to this company. It's not my favorite from the trilogy. I really like Paladins. It's probably my number one, and Viscounts was fantastic. But when I first got introduced, it was a friend who brought in this particular game to our game night. I ended up choosing a couple weeks later. He chose it again within the next month. I chose it again. It was a big choice. We all loved it. What I think is fantastic about the game is the fact that there are a lot of avenues to success and that it did not require me to fully commit to one type of avenue to be able to compete. I think that having those multiple roads to winning and knowing that there's no guarantee, but if you're paying attention to what's going on with your opponents, if you're paying attention to what's going on on the board, that you always have a chance. I love that. A game that forces me down one avenue to win for me is not a winning condition for a game to be on my shelf. So in this game, we look at some of the pieces that came with this. The board was the biggest piece for me. It really told a story. When you're dealing with a board for most board games, you're talking about hoping that you can at least get a feel for what the game is. Now, when you're talking about older games, 90s and 80s games, there was a lot of white space, just a lot of unused, untapped potential on these big boards. Obviously, Monopoly predates that, but you think of Monopoly, and it's a great rondelle, you know, going around. But in the center, there wasn't a lot going on, especially if you weren't using the home rules. The instant that you weren't collecting money in the center, all of a sudden there's just a huge amount of board that's not being touched. It was a weird setup back in the day. You know, sorry, another example, you know, or any of these games where it's just there's this big center and you don't seem to be doing anything with it. In this game, there is a lot going on. Now, if we were to go over, just looking at this board, there is a lot of places to go, but the board tells a story. You know, you have this kingdom that's being built up. You have a lot of spots you can go to, but even the places that are just a little bit of unused potential taps, they're all part of the picture. They're telling you, hey, look beyond just your option and look at the, the, the story in front of you. Now you have the cathedral. You could work on the cathedral all game. Now, the cathedral is a very, I love this type of spot on the board because it is about being quick. If you're not in there fast and somebody gets ahead of you, then they have the option to keep ahead of you and eventually you start getting cut off. If you're playing this five player, there's only three spots on the bottom. So if three people go and do it, nobody can move forward on, below them until one of them goes up to the next level. Again, if the three of them go up again, now they've opened up the bottom level, but nobody can get tied or beyond them. And then once you get up to the next one, well, those three, now it's two, and then it's two, and then it's one. So it gets to a point where you go, hey, if two of us get tied in that second spot, nobody's getting first but us. It's pretty good. The downside to it is I may commit fully to the cathedral attack, get all the way to the top and get 20 points. Now, that is probably the best single spot on the board, cards, anything, to get a point value from. However, second place is 12. Somebody else might say, ah, I made my effort, you know, I got in, you know, after the, the first couple people went, I got in on the bottom level, I kept with you guys for the, the third, and I stopped the second, and I stopped at the third. And that's where they kind of redirected elsewhere, made their points, and at some point they came back when they saw a few people move up and said, okay, let me quickly get that last one. And now I'll move up to the second. They're getting 12. 
only eight points less. That's a pretty good amount of points. And they were able to do it without having to fully commit to the spot. So I've seen people get first place there. Not only do they lose, they lose by a lot. Because while it feels like you've gotten this big payout, it's not really 20 points. It's really eight points. Because whoever got second place is only getting eight less. And they made one less levels commitment, which is a lot. Two glass, two gold, a card. That's a lot of resources for that one eight point spot that if you instead have spread yourself out elsewhere you can continue to make points and you might hit a point here you might put two points on a card over there you might hit a few points on your loyalty track all of a sudden eight points isn't that much to make up speaking of your track on the side here this is to me the unique piece to this game now i do feel that the follow-ups definitely continued this aspect but this game, it's the heaviest in, and this game's what introduced me to this. So to me, this is a very unique part of this game. The idea being, in the game, you have a lot of options. You can choose to go to the black market. It's one of the most powerful spots on the board. You can get a lot of really top-notch resources. The problem with the black market is it does two things. One, it's going to drop you down on this on the right. Now, if you go far enough down, eventually it starts meaning you're going to pay less stuff because you don't have to pay taxes because now you're considered to be an outlaw. However, that also means you're getting, instead of be getting no points or gaining points, you actually lose points. If you get all the way to the bottom and you don't get off of that bottom track at the end of the game, that's a negative nine points from your score. It's not good. On top of that, whenever you put people into the black market, they end up over in the jail which now is putting of your 20 meeples. We all have our big groups of meeples in here. You know, our different different colors, really nice resource. I like these guys, you know, these are, these are a really great piece, but these are, these are finite. Now, 20 seems like a lot, and it is. It's not like you're gonna just run out of these, but the more and more that end up in jail, the more likely you're gonna end up getting hit with negative points, getting yourself debts that you have to pay off, potentially have other people that are being captured by your opponents. It's It can add up quick. I've never seen somebody be completely hindered by it. There's usually a pretty good way to get it back. However, it could be an issue if all of a sudden you realize, oh no, I got, I got eight people in jail and like three owned by that guy and two owned by him and I'm only using nine now. It adds up quick. The other piece to this game to me is you've got your art. Your art is top-notch. Your resources. I love these resources. They're old school wooden, but they get the point across. They, it's, it's fun. I think the theme, it just bleeds through. I think that the game is not hard to get. You definitely can get this from any major board game store. You know, obviously, not every store sells every single type of game, but the majority of stores should have this in stock. It's always on Amazon. You may have an issue finding it in, say, your Barnes and Nobles or your Targets. It's not a it's not a big store like that type of game. But most of the games that we find there aren't games that we necessarily really want in our collection. They tend to have a finite amount of what we consider to be top notch board gamers games. So this, but this is a great game. It's not sixty dollars. Uh, I believe this one comes in at fifty, and occasionally you can find it as low as forty. So it's actually pretty affordable. It does take a while. I don't care how many people you're playing with in this game. I don't care how many people have played this repetitively that you play with in the game. It's going to take some time. This is probably a 90 minute game and I wouldn't be shocked if it takes you sometimes two hours. And there's not a huge amount of setup to it, but definitely when you're packing up at the end, by the time all these resources and cards are out, there's a lot to put away. So, it's a, it's a big recommendation for me. I think everybody should try it. I don't think it's for everyone's collection. I don't think this is a must own, but I think it's a must play at least once. Give it a shot. See what you think about it. It's It's got some great opportunity to at least introduce you to this idea of a trilogy of games. And to me, it was a fantastic entry game into that particular grouping. It's still one I love. It's just compared to the other ones in the grouping, it's now fallen down to my third or fourth in total from that. But highly recommend i hope that you guys give it a try hope you enjoy it and i hope you had another day great talking with me the meeples champion subscribe 
like the video, and I'll talk to you tomorrow. Have a good one.